My name's uh, Nigel Kay. I'm an associate lecturer uh, here at the college, uh, and this is the first of two webinars we're conducting today uh, on the impact of social media on emergency response uh, and recovery. Uh, I'm not quite sure uh, how long this presentation is going to take. I suspect about 30 minutes, 35 minutes possibly, uh, and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions before we have to wrap up at uh, 9 o'clock this morning. Uh, and in the next hour or so, what I want to uh, discuss with you uh, is the extraordinary changes that have been taking place in the media landscape, not just in Britain, of course, but uh, around the world. Uh, how social media, which we once saw as very much a marginal activity, is now, I would contend, uh, very much uh, a mainstream activity, a mainstream part of the media landscape here in the UK. Uh, and I want to raise with you uh, a number of questions about what this means for communications culture in our organizations, how we organize uh, the communications function, uh, and in particular, of course, because this is the Emergency Planning College, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, the impact that social media is having on um, uh, the, emer the, the business of emergency management. And we're going to be looking at uh, three particular phases of emergency management. We're going to be looking at preparation for emergencies, our responsibility to, to warn and inform. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the response phase, uh, the impact that social media now is having on uh, emergency responders. Uh, and I'm going to look at the three M's, uh, the value of uh, social media as a myth-busting tool. Uh, I want to look at new mapping technologies. How we build a better picture of what's taking place on the ground using social media. Uh, and uh, I want to um, look, too, at some of the monitoring tools that are, that are available now to um, us uh, to use to find out what people are saying about us, our organizations, and the way we are responding to uh, emergencies. Uh, and finally, I want to look at the recovery phase, how we help people recover from emergencies. Uh, and I think it's a, a, a role of social media which has been uh, not discussed a great deal up until now. I want to look at the role of Facebook and possibly Twitter, too, in that recovery phase. So uh, that's what I want to try and get through during the course of the next half hour or so, and, as I say, allowing plenty of time for discussion. Uh, but first, let me ask you uh, a question, a rhetorical question, uh, I have to say. Imagine that you were um, a young woman, uh, 13 or 14, out with your friend uh, on the beach in South Wales, uh, and you've misjudged the tide. The tide is coming in, not going out, and you find yourself trapped uh, on the rocks. The question is, you've got a mobile phone, uh, what do you do? Well, uh, five or ten years ago, you or I in those circumstances most certainly have dialed 999. But uh, this is an actual story. It comes from uh, South Wales. Earlier this year, two young girls, you can see them there in the picture between the two Iron Ally crew, two young girls trapped on those rocks uh, instead of dialing 999 on their mobile phone, simply went onto Facebook and posted a status update. Help, I'm stuck on rocks, uh, come and help me. Fortunately, it was seen by somebody at the RNLI and uh, a rescue crew was dispatched. But I like this story because it demonstrates to me just how uh, Facebook, Twitter, other social media are becoming an increasingly important part uh, of our lives and how for certain sections in society, um, that it is the normal way uh, of, communi uh, of communicating. To understand this, you have to look at the, the, the latest figures for Facebook uh, in this country, and they are quite uh, remarkable. Facebook now has 51% uh, of the UK population signed up as account holders. Uh, that's an extraordinary figure because it's happened in uh, a matter of no more than four or five years. 51% uh, of the UK population. Now, I'm not claiming that all those accounts are active. Some of them will certainly uh, be redundant, and some of them may well be corporate accounts too. But uh, uh, all the research by Ofcom uh, and a number of other organizations points to the fact that uh, more than half the UK population uh, are now familiar with and use uh, social media, including primarily uh, Facebook. And what's driving this take of Facebook uh, is the introduction of smartphone uh, technology. Again, this is data from uh, Ofcom, uh, published uh, last year. 27% uh, of adults last year owned a smartphone, 
47% of teenagers. And what's significant about these smartphones is their 3G capability, their, their uh, ability to connect us with uh, the Internet. Uh, Ofcom described in its report the UK uh, as a nation addicted to smartphones. What are the symptoms of this addiction? Well, you probably recognize them yourselves. These are people who uh, use smartphones during meetings uh, to uh, text and um, talk to uh, friends on Twitter, people who use them at the meal table, people who take them to the bathroom with them. Uh, these are the symptoms of smartphone uh, addiction. Uh, and as we now know, of course, uh, Apple uh, announced plans uh, a couple of weeks ago to introduce their latest uh, iPhone with 4G capability. And we now know that uh, one of the big UK networks, EE, uh, are about to introduce uh, 4G technology, which will uh, make, uh, I suggest, uh, the use of smartphones for uh, communications other than making phone calls almost ubiquitous uh, in this country. Um, here's some more research from Ofcom which demonstrates how the communications picture is changing in the UK. Uh, only 18 months ago, 71 megabytes was the figure for uh, monthly data use on average by UK smartphone consumers. Uh, that has doubled uh, in the 18 months up to January uh, 2012. 140, 100, sorry, 154 uh, megabits a month. You can see the extraordinary growth in the use of smartphones and their use to access uh, digital information. And here's a slide from Ofcom which uh, shows uh, another set of interesting trends. This is uh, part of their analysis of how people use all telecoms services. Uh, and what's interesting here is that uh, there's been some increase, just over 5% increase in people using accessing social networks on uh, PCs and, and, and laptops. But the really big increase uh, in proportional terms on the right-hand side of that slide is the number of people accessing uh, the Internet via their mobiles. This supports uh, the data we've just seen. Interestingly, I don't know, if it's not my experience, but it may not be yours, but that, that, that bar graph in the middle there, email on PCs, email is falling. Actually, the amount of email being sent on PCs uh, is falling, down by 20%. Down by and I suspect that it honestly reflects the fact that people are now using social media rather than email uh, to communicate with uh, one another. Uh, and Ofcom has done some research into how we communicate with our friends uh, and family. 58% of us use, uh, are sending text messages at least once a day to, to friends and family. I find it extraordinary that only 49% of us are having face-to-face -face conversations with friends and family. But look at that figure for social networking. 32% of us now using social networks to communicate with friends and family uh, during the day. That's more than the number of people using conventional fixed, line, fixed landlines. Only 29% of us now use conventional phone during the day uh, to talk uh, to friends and family. Social media has overtaken uh, landline phones, but it hasn't yet it's caught up with uh, text messaging. What are people doing on their mobile phones? Again from Ofcom, this market study they did last year, this confirms the preeminence of Facebook as uh, the number one uh, social media site uh, in the UK. Uh, don't worry too much about the figures on this slide. Uh, just look at the relativities. But Facebook is being, uh, well, well, let me put it this way, uh, people in the UK spend two and a half billion minutes a year on Facebook, and that was as of December 2010, so we're nearly two years on from that. Uh, and they far outstrip in terms of popularity uh, all the other sites that people are accessing on their mobiles, like Google, Yahoo. For me, as a former BBC journalist, it's good to see the BBC up there. But really, you know, this is, uh, this is the only, uh, what I would call, conventional journalism site in this list, BBC. Uh, and it's way, way, way below... Uh, Facebook uh, and Google. And I suspect a lot of that access, that viewing of BBC sites, is not even news either. It may well be people using uh, iPlayer, accessing iPlayer on their mobile phones. So what we're seeing here is a pattern where uh, social media is, as I say, moving from the margins 
uh, into, uh, into the mainstream. Who are the people who are doing it? Well, in the main, as we know, it's younger people. Uh, this figure suggests, and let me say as an aside, Social Bakers, where this data comes from, is a really useful site. Uh, if you want good quality analytics about uh, the impact of social media, go to Social Bakers. It's free. There's a hell of a lot of information uh, about uh, individual countries, about individual cities as well. Uh, this, is, uh, this is their age breakdown in terms of uh, users. And what you can see is that uh, almost half uh, of Facebook users in the United Kingdom are aged between 24 uh, and 34. But it's not entirely a young person's uh, medium at all, because a third of those, you know, the next three groups, a third of Facebook users are aged between 35 and 64. So it's a third of Facebook users uh, I would describe as, uh, as uh, early to, to, to mid, mid-aged, uh, 35 to, uh, to 64. So uh, it's not entirely, uh, by any means, uh, a young person's medium. Uh, uh, there is a slight uh, skew towards uh, women users, slightly more women users and male users, but um, maybe that uh, doesn't surprise you. What about Twitter? Well, The Guardian is my source for the data about Twitter. Uh, a story published recently in The Guardian says uh, that uh, Twitter now has 10 million users uh, in the UK, the fourth largest country for Twitter users in the world. Once again, we see that 80% of people are accessing it uh, via, their, via their mobile phone. All this, of course, at a time when conventional media are struggling. This is a report published earlier this year by three uh, ex-journalists uh, who now work as academics, uh, and uh, it makes depressing reading for former newspaper journalists like myself. Uh, in the last three or four years, the circulation, the combined circulation of all UK newspapers has fallen by 20%. And for those of us in the business of local and regional, uh, then the figures look even worse. Local and regional newspaper sales are down by 20%, sorry, 29% over the last three or four years. And these this, newspapers has been the primary means of communication for people in the public sector for the past uh, 25, uh, 30 years and they are in decline. Uh, in the last two years, more than 1,000 re regional journalists have lost their jobs, people working for local newspapers, uh, people uh, working for ITV, regional TV companies, and now, uh, because of the latest rounds of cuts in the BBC, a lot of BBC journalists, too, uh, being, uh, being laid off. And you look at these figures for some of our biggest newspapers in the country, uh, and they make quite depressing uh, viewing. If you live in Birmingham, only 7.6% of households now take uh, the Birmingham Mail, uh, which is, you know, was one of our flagship evening newspapers uh, in the UK. At the other end of the spectrum, picture slightly better, Sunderland Echo seems to have uh, whatever it takes to uh, continue to uh, succeed there. Uh, they're one of the best performers in the UK, 30%. Uh, there. So there's, a, there's an upside in, in, in Sunderland, but typically the uh, Southampton Daily Echo, uh, mid-table, 15.2% penetration. Uh, Whole Daily Mail, another very successful brand in the past, uh, a 20% penetration by, by household. These are figures that are taken from the newspaper industry's own website. Interestingly, I was having a conversation with a couple of years ago with some colleagues in Southampton working for the City Council there uh, who were looking at how their communications team was structured. Uh, and at that time, uh, they calculated that the uh, penetration of the local evening newspaper was about 19%. It was going into 19% of the homes in the city. But they were devoting uh, rather more than 45% of their total resources to dealing with the evening paper on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and the challenge for them, as they saw it, was how they switched resources from dealing with uh, traditional, conventional media, like local newspapers, uh, to the new and emerging digital media, like Facebook uh, and, and Twitter. Uh, I've mentioned local radio. I ought to say that um, uh, reach to BBC local radio stations in England is falling. It's now down to 19%. It was anywhere between 22 and 25%. 
Uh, and this is a, a pattern that's being replicated across most of, uh, most of the UK. That's weekly reach. So 19% of the adults in the UK uh, listen to local radio for a period of at least half an hour uh, once a week. That's what that, that's what that tells us. It's not a huge figure. Uh, regional TV, uh, holding up pretty well, actually. Most <coughs> regional TV programs are the most popular news programs on television in their area. Uh, BBC nightly news programs like Look North, where we are here in Yorkshire, have a 28% of the TV audience at that time of the evening. Pretty good share. Uh, and uh, for ITV programs, typically their share is 20% of the audience at that, at that time of the evening. And that translates for your typical uh, regional TV news program into an audience of about uh, half a million, but clearly it depends on the size uh, of the region. But that's not local. Uh, it's regional. So we've seen those figures for TV, we've seen the figures for radio and newspapers, and let me remind you about the figure for Facebook. 51% of the UK population now have uh, Facebook accounts. So my contention is that social media is moving uh, into the mainstream at the expense of conventional medium, uh, media. It is no longer a marginal activity. Here at the college we do some work with Middle East governments uh, I was in Abu Dhabi and uh, Dubai earlier this year uh, looking at some work uh, done by the Dubai School of Government following the, uh, Arab, the so called Arab Spring. Uh, and you know, the, the headline uh, on their report about the impact of social media in the uh, Arab Spring this is no longer about dating and football. Social media is an important tool for social change. Uh, and it's exactly the same. Uh, governments around the world are coming to the same conclusion. Uh, this la in the last couple of months, we've seen the Cabinet Office in the UK publish quite a useful pamphlet entitled Smart Tips about the use of uh, social media in, uh, in an emergency. And how they summarise social media, this is a technology that is for the people, by the people, uh, and uh, about the people. Uh, but I think we have to understand why... Uh, Networks like Facebook and Twitter are so popular. Why, why have these changes uh, taken place? Well, I think what we need to say, first of all, is that people who use uh, social media uh, feel a much greater sense of ownership about the content. Uh, they create the content, uh, they put it up, they own the pictures, they own the status updates. They may not own the networks, but they own the content. And for people who for years and years and years have felt uh, excluded from conventional media because they haven't, their voice hasn't been heard in conventional media. Uh, it feels um, you know, a much more inclusive uh, medium. Uh, it's very accessible, uh, as we know. Anyone who uses uh, Facebook or Twitter knows how easy it is to set up a ca an account uh, and, and, and to start uh, communicating with your, uh, with your friends and with people who live nearby. Uh, and it's pretty cheap, actually. I'm, I'm my iPhone contract cost me uh, £10 a month now. It's gone down from 40 quid. It's now only uh, 10 quid a month. Uh, well, that's um, actually cheaper than my daily newspaper. It's on a par with my uh, TV license fee. It's, uh, it's not expensive. I can't give you uh, uh, any accurate data for uh, this trust factor. But what we know and what people claim... Uh, is that there are much higher levels of trust in terms of the messages that people receive on social media than in almost any other um, form of, uh, of media. Um, it, it's as high, some people say, as 75%. Uh, and this is all about, this is all about uh, user recommendation, about peer recommendation. This is about the business model that's enabled Amazon to become one of the world's leading businesses, or eBay. They've developed new trust systems based on personal recommendation. And people believe, to an extraordinary degree, what their friends and colleagues are telling them on Facebook and on Twitter. They trust it. Uh, it's very quick, and as we know in the field of emergency management, increasingly people are finding out about the big things that happen, the big events that happen. They're finding out about these things on social media rather than conventional media. And as we know only too well, uh, many organizations who find themselves uh, in the middle uh, of an emergency 
uh, often the first intimation comes to them now through social media and not through uh, formal channels. And the big point to make here as well is that social media is, is two-way. Uh, it, uh, it appeals to people because uh, they can have a conversation, they can have a dialogue. Uh, and I think that from our point of view as emergency managers, uh, we really have to understand the importance of uh, the value of this two-way process. The ability for us to build a much better picture of what's happening on the ground in an emergency because we have at our disposal potentially hundreds if not thousands of eyewitnesses, all of whom are contributing to a much fuller picture of let's say, what's going on on the ground. So that's why I think <coughs> networks are, and social networks like Facebook are so popular, and why I think these big changes uh, are taking place in the way we communicate. Uh, and this was picked up last year after exercise watermark. This will, be, uh, this will be an exercise that some of you today will be familiar with, may well have taken part in. This was a UK-wide uh, flooding uh, exercise, a simulation of flooding. Uh, and... Um, uh, the report published by the Watermark team after the exercise makes really uh, interesting reading from my perspective uh, because for the first time uh, uh, someone in government is saying uh, there is now a persuasive case for the use of social media. Uh, two main arguments for that. One, it bypasses uh, conventional media. We no longer have to rely on local newspapers, local radio to get our messages out. We can talk directly to the people involved in an emergency uh, through social media. We can influence the way that they behave uh, in terms of uh, preparing them for evacuation, helping to evacuate them, uh, do whatever else is necessary, uh, talking to them directly using uh, social media. And uh, because, as I say, of this two-way uh, information flow, uh, it's possible for, possible for them as well to tell, to tell us what their priorities are in the, in the communities which are most severely affected by uh, any particular emergency. And the Watermark team go on in their report to say this. They recommend that all government departments and emergency responders assess social media capability and think about removing any barriers so they can start to lead the way in social media conversation. This is about introducing a social media culture into your organizations now before uh, the emergency happens. Uh, a personal aside, I go into many public sector organizations during the course of the year um, on behalf of the Emergency Planning College invited in to do social media training. Uh, frankly, uh, it's very frustrating. Uh, normally about two days before I go, I ring up the local IT department, uh, ask them to make sure that I've got access to the network when I get there to do the training. Uh, that in itself can sometimes be a challenge. But the really frustrating thing is when I plug in my laptop, turn it on, uh, I find that even though I'm there to do social media training, I can't access any of the sites uh, that I need to, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, whatever. And I understand the reasons why, uh, but I think this is uh, an illustration of the kind of change that uh, the exercise watermark team were looking for when they said we need to remove the barriers and start to lead uh, the way, in, uh, the way in, in, in social media conversation. Because for emergency planners and emergency managers, there's a real challenge here. We have traditionally relied on a model of command and control, which assumes that uh, we can respond most effectively to uh, an emergency uh, if we build up a really good picture of what's taking place. If we, if we have a really good flow of information coming in, can respond to that information and react in, a, in an appropriate way. And of course, what we're finding now is we no longer have a, a monopoly of, uh, on that information, either on the way it comes in or the way it's distributed. Our messages may be lost among all the other messages that are going out from people who are actually involved in the emergency, eyewitnesses, bystanders, people stuck in their homes or whatever. And command and control simply doesn't work effectively if you don't control the flow of information. And we no longer, I would submit, control that flow of information. So it's a real, real challenge for us. But what's the solution? Well, the solution is to be in there. It's to be in that conversation. It's to be in that debate. It's to be monitoring, listening, uh, and responding to what people are telling us, and to be talking to them on the channels that they use, and increasingly, of course, 
hope I've made the case now. That is, uh, as well as, I'm not suge suggesting instead of, but as well as conventional media, we, we need to be using uh, social media. Uh, this was the gist of the paper I referred to earlier, published by uh, the Cabinet Office uh, earlier this year. Uh, you can find it online, I think, on the UK Resilience uh, uh, website. Uh, and they summarise the benefits of social media for government quite succinctly uh, in that leaflet. The only one point there that I would uh, draw your attention to uh, uh, is that, again, at the bottom, uh, you know, we reduce our dependence on traditional media channels. And it's really, really important that we uh, use social media to counter uh, myths, any other inaccurate uh, reporting that develops either in convention or indeed uh, social media. Uh, I'm going to talk now about um, uh, preparing for uh, emergencies, and in particular about our warning and informing responsibilities under the Civil Contingencies Act. Uh, I can only scratch the surface here, but again, a personal story. The, uh, when I was um, affected by flooding where I live in Dorset earlier this summer, uh, and I, at 9 o'clock on the Sunday morning, seeing water running down the road outside, unable to get uh, out of town because all the roads I discovered when I went out were, were, were closed, uh, did I, where, where, where did I get the best information from? Unquestionably uh, from uh, social media both official and unofficial sources on social media. Draw your attention to, I think, what a great site and a great service, the Flood Alert Service developed by the uh, Environment Agency in partnership with uh, a private company. Uh, I was receiving, once I'd logged on and, uh, and subscribed to the service, regular email and Twitter updates on uh, the flooding situation in my area, really very detailed, down to within 100 metres of uh, my house, uh, and uh, if I logged on at home, really accurate and very helpful maps about which roads were, were closed and weren't. I think um, this is a very good, uh, the flood alert site is a very good uh, service indeed. Uh, and what's great about it is, of course, you can allow people uh, to get involved because it's on Facebook, because flood alerts uh, is hosted by Facebook. Uh, you can, uh, people who are in, in who are affected by the flooding in a particular area can take part in the conversation and contribute uh, their own experiences and pass on information to other, other people in the locality uh, who uh, will also be affected. So best routes around a particular problem or, or whatever, or help is needed here, or I know where I can get sandbags. This kind of stuff is all supplementary information which can be uh, posted on Facebook around uh, this uh, environment agency uh, service, which I I'd highly recommend. Um, and there are plenty of examples now of other organizations starting to use Facebook as their main platform for warning and informing and preparing the public for uh, emergencies. Uh, the Western Isles Emergency Planning Coordinating Group were one of the first in the field. I like their site. Um, I'm afraid I can't show you live today because we don't have the bandwidth. But uh, here's a, a snapshot from uh, their site a couple of months ago. Uh, and they regularly update residents in the Western Isles about the threat from uh, storms, gales, other uh, weather hazards, uh, and, and, and any other uh, potential emergency. Uh, and they have chosen to use Facebook because of its ability to engage the community and for people to get involved in the conversation about how to prepare for these emergencies. Uh, they're continuing to use Facebook as their uh, primary platform. And I think... Uh, those of us who are interested in, in, in community resilience, uh, I think Facebook is going to become potentially one of the most significant ways that local communities can organize themselves uh, to prepare, to become more resilient, to prepare for uh, emergencies. Moving on quickly to the response phase uh, of an emergency. Uh, we've all seen plenty of examples over the last couple of years, including the London riots, about how uh, people have been using um, Facebook and Twitter in order to uh, report what's going on in their streets uh, and some would say to you know, engage, uh, engage other people in nefarious activities. But let me tell you a story about uh, this fire that took place in uh, the Newcastle suburb of Biker last year. Uh, this is a, a fire in a tyre plant, um, a column of smoke as you can see that could be seen for 20 to 30 miles. 
And within two hours, a Facebook group had been set up, uh, described rather facetiously, or named rather facetiously as I Survived the Great Fire of Biker. And as you can see, from that figure on the right-hand side of your screens, uh, within a couple of hours, over 12,000 people had signed up for this Facebook site. These are people who are interested in what's happening around them. They see this smoke, they can see it from some distance away. They want to find out what's happening, and they want to, they want to talk about it. Uh, what was impressive to me was that Tyne and Weir Fire and Rescue uh, decided immediately that they would post their important public service messages within this site. So they were getting their public, sector, their, their public safety messages out to 12,500 people who joined Facebook to talk about uh, this fire. And here you see an example of some of the state's updates that came in uh, during that afternoon. Here's somebody who describes himself just as the Clooney, just spoke to police, Biker Bank partially open, Lime Street open, Foundry Lane open within a couple of hours. So somebody comes on sharing information from a conversation they've had uh, with the police. But here's Tyne and Weir Fire and Rescue putting in their own message early in the afternoon. 72 firefighters are gaining control of the fire, currently working to stop it from spreading to the main building. So an important message about reassurance. We're in control. We're managing this. We've got uh, plenty of resources there. We're dealing with it. Um, Northumbria University, please be aware that the fire in Biker is now under control. There's no risk to university staff or students. So another big local organisation deciding that Facebook is a way they're going to communicate with their stakeholder groups and get these key messages out about, in their case, uh, the fact that there was no disruption to university uh, services. Uh, Tyne and Weir Fire and Rescue again. We're using a special appliance to pump water from the Tyne as well as local hydrants to put the fire out quicker. So keeping people up to date with how the uh, firefighting operations are, are going. Uh, somebody else, uh, anonymous, uh, posts a status update saying fire crews have the fire under control and are expected to be at the scene into the night, and they've asked crowds to disperse to get rid of some congestion. There have been no deaths and only one minor injury. <coughs> An excellent job by Tyne and Weir Fire and Rescue Service. So praise from somebody anonymously for the services provided by Fire and Rescue, and they've provided a link uh, to the Tyne and Weir uh, Fire and Rescue website. Talking to Tyne and Weir, what was really interesting is they got masses of these congratulatory messages, and they were able to cut them out of Facebook, paste them up, and stick them on the crew rooms when the crews came back at the end of uh, the fire. Uh, and um, one further uh, benefit, they received in the next week 40 applications from people within this group uh, for consideration for jobs as firefighters. So uh, a really good uh, response in the broader sense of in terms of uh, community engagement and improving people's appreciation of your, uh, of your, of your services. Uh, Northumbria Police urgently request people watching the incident to disperse as they're adding to con congestion. Uh, and then you'll find this final message uh, really reassuring. Uh, good news to report, uh, Cheryl Cole has been unharmed in the fire. And that's a kind of light-hearted um, tweet, status update, that uh, you know, characterizes much of what goes on on uh, uh, Facebook and why so many people find it uh, really, really uh, engaging. Um, I said I talked about myth-busting. I'm a big... Uh, Leicester sports fan, follow Leicester City, Leicester Tigers, but I live in Dorset. And I found increasingly that the best way of finding out what's going on uh, on a Saturday afternoon is to follow the games uh, on Twitter from people sitting inside the grounds. Not only do I get the score, uh, but I get uh, their impression of how the game is going. Uh, and um, I follow one chap called David McLean, who's a local journalist, or was a local journalist in Leicester. And on the Saturday afternoon in question, um, he wasn't at the game, which I was trying to follow. He was actually uh, monitoring uh, a demonstration by the far-right group, uh, the EDL, uh, and um, he was tweeting uh, uh, as a journalist uh, about uh, what, was, uh, what was happening in the city that afternoon. And so if you go from the bottom upwards, as my Twitter feed does, police are tackling crowds of people running around Abbey Park, not sure who at the moment, uh, We've got into the park, eventually looks like a group attempting to get into uh, the EDL in, in, enclosure, and then shortly afterwards the police saying, look, <clears throat> we have a large presence uh, in Abbey Park, we're dealing with the situation and there are no issues. 
So, uh, as I go around the country, I come across police forces increasingly who are using uh, uh, social media in a very intelligent way uh, in terms of managing big public order uh, events and certainly finding it very useful indeed uh, in terms of myth-busting, knocking on the head uh, quite quickly suggestions that things may be getting out of control or, or, or whatever. <coughs> Mapping, I said I'd talk about. And bear in mind, we can only scratch the surface this morning, but this is um, an example from uh, the last few weeks about a site that was set up by <coughs> excuse me, a series of um, a group of people uh, really plotting disruption during uh, the Olympics. They were using uh, a site, a mapping site called Ushahidi. Ushahidi is an open source resource. Anyone can use it. It was a, a mapping tool developed in Kenya. It's a, it's a sweet Swahili word. It was developed in Kenya to monitor examples of election violence, but it's been now adopted all over the world by organizations that want to monitor um, the impact of uh, emergencies. And each of these little red dots on this map uh, represents an incident, a disruption of some kind, basically to transport or travel during uh, the uh, uh, the Olympics uh, at, any, at any given time. And if you uh, go in further uh, and click on any one of these dots, you get a bit more information. So it tells you here that the Metropolitan Line was experiencing uh, severe delays. And I can zoom in even further uh, and <coughs> I get information that tells me uh, more about the precise delays on the Metropolitan Line. Uh, and uh, the important thing is that all this information has been contributed by users. Some of it will be official, not all of it, but a lot of it is based on people's experience of using transport services in London uh, at the, on that afternoon during, um, during the Olympics. And of course people say, well, uh, how can we trust this? Uh, well, here's a little button up here, uh, and that tells you whether the report has been officially verified or not. So the people who set this service up uh, will post information some of which in the first stages of reporting will be unverified, but as soon as they manage to get confirmation, they press a button and up comes the, uh, the, verified, uh, the verified tag. Now, there are all sorts of uh, mapping applications like this which help us, A, build up a better picture of what's going on on the ground from, uh, it's called crowdsourcing, uh, <clears throat> but also, of course, which uh, are shared uh, with uh, the, wider, the wider community. I want to talk briefly this morning, too, about monitoring. People say to me, well, how do we know what's being said about us? How do we, you say we can build up a better picture of what's going on uh, on the ground. How do we do this? Uh, is it expensive? Does it require more resources? Do we need more people? The truth of the matter is that a lot of the tools that enable us to do this uh, are already out there, and they're free. They've got nice, catchy names, like uh, Addictomatic. Uh, I just typed in Bike of Fire. Quite recently, this is a couple of weeks ago, I put this slide together. I typed in Bike of Fire. Uh, and up comes references from Twitter almost instantly to, to recent tweets about the bike of fire, uh, YouTube videos uh, featuring the bike of fire. <clears throat> and if we were to scroll down that page, you'd see that Addictomatic has searched virtually all social media sources uh, and can present to us in a very usable way um, <clears throat> information, latest information about any emergency, any incident, any organization that we're interested in. And you can click on any of those tweets or any of those YouTube videos, uh, and uh, uh, they will run. I like social mention. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, I'd recommend social mention to you quite strongly. It's a bit slower than a dictomatic. Uh, but uh, again, you type in a, a reference term. Uh, here I typed in Paralympics. Ignore the reference to Dorset County Council at the top of the page. That was an earlier search. Paralympics, it comes up with all the latest tweets featuring the word or the hashtag Paralympics. Uh, and then it gives you some analysis on the left-hand side. Uh, and here what it's saying is that, on average, uh, <coughs> Paralympics was being mentioned on Twitter every 12 seconds. The last mention was 34 seconds ago. And then it attempts to analyze the sentiment within those messages. This isn't uh, <coughs> you know, enormously well-developed at the moment, but they're using algorithms with keywords programmed into them, positive and negative sounding words. And, uh, it tells you how many of those messages it believes are broadly positive, 
uh, and how many negative. And if you were able to click through, and we can't this morning, but if you click through, you could then read all the positive or all the negative messages. <clears throat> In terms of what's, what search words, what keywords are people using to talk about the Paralympics, those are the most important ones down the left-hand side. And again, you can click on those and uh, see all the individual tweets. And then below that, it tells you who are the top users using um, Twitter to talk about the Paralympics. And at the top of that list, to I think probably official users, Olympics medals, Paralympic sport. But there will be, if we could go down that page, some individual uh, individuals using Twitter to talk about various Paralympic events, successes, achievements, whatever. This is free. It's developing all the time. And it's a really uh, useful tool uh, and should be at the heart, in my view, of any uh, monitoring operation uh, during uh, uh, an emergency. And finally, I said I wanted to talk about uh, the recovery part of uh, emergency management, the third phase, if you like. And here I just wanted to remind you about the impact of the whole floods in 2007, pre-Facebook, pre-Twitter. Uh, quite devastating in terms of uh, the city of Hull. Um, 7,800 homes flooded, 8,000 uh, made homeless, some families in temporary accommodation for over uh, 18 months. Uh, and Hull City Council commissioned quite a lot of research at the time from academics about the impact uh, that these floods had on various aspects of, uh, of life in the city. Uh, and uh, what the academics identified was that uh, the, that once the emergency services are pulled out and once people have been rehoused by the local authority, there was quite a gap. Uh, so it took up to a year, 18 months in some cases, I'm told even two years for one or two families, to get these families rehoused. Uh, and what the, uh, they, they labelled this period between uh, the emergency itself and, the, uh, and um, the resumption of normal services, they labelled that the recovery gap. And they said the gap was characterized for people who lived in Hull by a lack of information, a sense of helplessness. Uh, they weren't, they felt, involved in the conversations that were taking place about how soon it would take to repair their homes. They weren't involved in the conversations about what measures were being put in place to prevent this happening again. Now, I think Facebook, Twitter are, are, are ideal tools for enabling us to... Uh, allow communities to continue to operate as communities, perhaps only in a virtual sense, but to continue uh, to operate as communities despite this widespread uh, disruption. So I think, you know, and it, this can't be top down, it has to be you know, a grassroots thing. All the evidence suggests that when uh, uh, local authorities, other organizations move in and try and impose top down solutions using social media, they aren't effective. That actually this stuff has to start from grassroots. Uh, but that means that we do have a role. It means we have a role in making sure that people have connectivity and that are able to access social media. But my suggestion is, you know, that uh, <coughs> in this recovery gap, what we would want to see is virtual communities springing up to replace uh, uh, actual communities that have been devastated. Uh, allowing people to continue to talk to their neighbours, even though they may be living in temporary accommodation at, at opposite, opposite ends of the city. That by monitoring what they're saying, by listening to them, we can address that information deficit. We can give them the information they need about uh, how long it's taking to uh, rehouse them. That they can, uh, by being part of this network, uh, achieve a degree of mutual support and, and, and continue to encourage of people through these virtual networks, uh, that they can take part in the debate about how the new communities are going to look, what they're going to feel like, what we're going to put in place there, and most importantly, of course, we can give them a voice in uh, the, the, the wider, the broader debate about uh, what uh, plans we're going to put in place to make sure that this uh, can never happen again. Now, this is a piece of work uh, that still needs to be done. It hasn't been done yet. Um, uh, as I look around, uh, not just in the UK, but in other countries around the world, people are starting to use social media in very intelligent ways, very responsive ways in emergencies, certainly for warning and informing, certainly for responding to emergencies. But I don't think yet that we're starting to address the possibilities of social media in this recovery phase. 
So that's work to be done and work that, that we at the college would uh, dearly like to be involved in. As I said, I can only you know, scratch the surface here. We, talk, we haven't talked at all today about YouTube, uh, which is the second most used search engine in the world. I think video will be the next big thing on social media. People, I mean, every, every decent mobile phone now has its own camera. People uh, are telling their stories using video, posting it to YouTube, uh, posting it uh, to uh, uh, platforms like Social Cam. Uh, and, and increasingly, they're not just uh, using videos uh, uh, in a recorded form. They're, they're telling their stories live as well. And we now know that um, quite a lot of people um, involved in uh, public order events are, are broadcasting uh, their, their activity live uh, on uh, platforms like Ustream uh, and others. And this is beginning to change the dynamics of, uh, of public order events. Uh, the live reporting of what's happening by people using their own uh, their own smartphones. So there's a big piece of work to be done there too. And I haven't either today mentioned uh, the importance of GPS. The fact that every smartphone has a, a GPS chip, which, ena which which enables us to track people, but importantly, uh, for people to organise themselves on the ground. And we now know that demonstrators during a number of big events in the UK uh, recently have been using simple marketing tools like Foursquare, which are really, frankly, only intended to sell coffee, uh, tells you where the nearest Starbucks is. Uh, actually, people are now using that to organize themselves at public order events uh, and to try on occasions to outflank uh, the authorities by uh, you know, breaking away from marches and reforming elsewhere. And they're using social media in order to coordinate that. Big piece of work to be done there as well. Um, we at the college, uh, want to work with organizations like those that are represented this morning. Uh, we <clears throat> have uh, a number of ways in which we can uh, work with you. We do a social media uh, workshop here, a day-long course. Uh, we do um, uh, a broader media course with a lot of social media content. Uh, we can deliver these courses uh, either here or uh, increasingly popularly uh, at your place. Uh, perhaps you belong to a local resilience forum. Uh, we can uh, we can work with you uh, uh, as a team within the local resilience forum. We'll come and tailor courses for you, uh, and we'll even do consultancy for you. Um, so we're keen. Uh, we're keen to be involved uh, if we possibly can. Uh, I'm going to leave these um, contact details up on the screen for a little while. Uh, as I say, this presentation has been recorded. You can go back to it and uh, watch it. I hope in a day or two's time on our. Uh, Emergency Planning College website. You can get in touch with me via Twitter or via email, or you can contact our sales team here uh, at the Emergency Planning College. 